Hey guys, so I'm making this video because I'm done with a lot of the Lab Report 1 grading, but I'm not through through all of them. So I want to be able to give you guys feedback before you start your Lab Report 2, which you should be starting sometime this week. Um, just at least starting on the introduction and the methods and all that. So I'm going to make a first video about the feedback on Lab Report 1. So listen to all of the little um, comments I make about like the common mistakes that were done. And um, then I'll make another video about what exactly I'm looking for for lab report two. So the two videos should come in hand, uh, like hand in hand to better um, your writing for lab report two. But more than that, I do this to better your writing before you start taking um, your upper you know, your upper class uh, classes, courses, right? So the writing just gets harder from here. Um, you hardly really have a teacher or uh, maybe a TA that goes through these reports and gives you all these comments like, hey, this doesn't really sound professional or, you know, maybe you could have said this instead and this is really what we're looking for in the results or this is really what we're looking for in the methods section. So you're really not gonna have that going forward unless you go to like the writing center and even then some of the writing center tutors aren't really specific to scientific writing right they can help you with you know maybe a literature review or something like that but they get a little lost with results and methods and things like that so i'm hoping that i gave um you enough comments to better your writing uh, moving forward um you know, writing, you guys are all taking a biology class, y'all are probably STEM students, you know, you're looking to the direction of either um, becoming a researcher, going to grad school, becoming a researcher um, or a professor, or maybe going through medical school and getting your MD, or maybe some kind of profession in the medical fields, like a physical therapist or a pharmacist or anything like that. And all of those jobs have in common is detailed writing. So when you're writing a scientific report, you almost want to sound like a robot that spits out um, the facts and the findings of your study. I don't really want to hear your voice. There are some little areas in the report where I should be able to hear your voice. Um, but this is very different than the writing that you maybe have practiced in your English classes where you're like, doing a review about Shakespeare and, you know, using metaphors and things like that. You would, you don't want to do that in these types of reports. It's very much, what were the facts? What is the evidence out there that, you know, support your hypothesis? And what did your study find? What are the results behind your study? And more than that, what is, you know, that result, how does that result relate to the world? What is its major conclusion? So, um, when I give you guys all these little comments, don't really take them to heart. You know, I'm really, I don't mean it in a rude way, like, what were you trying to say here or anything like that? I'm really trying to say, like, you know, you got to clarify what you're saying. You need to be very detailed. It needs to say, um, you know, bacterial growth was averaging this much. And, you know, therefore, I know that 37 degree um, Celsius was, you know, the better adapt for these um, bacteria to grow in, the better environment for these um, bacteria to grow in. You know, they, you need to be very specific. You can't just say like, oh, warm conditions, bacteria like them. And, you know, it's just kind of like vague. So, you know, move away from vagueness and move away from, um, also move away from like overwording things. I saw this a lot, like, you know, for example, I think someone wrote like, um, you know, it's important to know bacteria for the growth of bacteria, or it's important to examine bacteria for the growth of, ba of the bacteria. And I'm like, you could have just said, like, this study examines bacterial growth. You know, very being very specific and not um, using extra words helps with that. So again, sounding kind of like a robot, like this study examines bacterial growth is a lot more professional than like, our group really looked at the bacteria and examined them and for their growth and the growth of bacteria. And it gets like, almost like a run on sentence, like where you go on and on and on, you know, like it, it, I think that sentence went more and it was like for the growth of bacteria and therefore we used 
two worms and I mean two um, plates at a control and two plates at a 30 and two plates at a 37 and we counted them and, and then we just kept went on and on and on when in reality you should separate those statements right so you when you do long statements like that um, you lose your main point your main point was what was the purpose of this um, of this experiment, you know, the purpose of this experiment is to examine bacterial growth, period. In order to do this, the study conducted a, an experiment in which we set um, two plates as a control and two plates as treated in the 30 degree uh, Celsius incubator. Furthermore, we, test, uh, we had test subjects or test plates that had, uh, that went into the 37, degree and and controls that correlated to that you know very you know chopping those up into separate sentences and making sure that every sentence has a main point is also really crucial so if you find yourself writing out these long long sentences make sure you reread reread your report right because you'll be able to point those out and then look at them and say did i have one main point in that sentence if i had two or three or four main points then you've already lost your reader um, and then the opposite of that is like these really, really short, I don't even want to call them sentences. They were mainly fragments. So a lot of times you would see these little phrases like growth at 37 is high. You know, the grammar issues were pretty strong when these lab report ones. Um, so that's uh, like a fragment or that's a short, way too short. And so I'm like, what were you trying to say there? You know, like use your words a little bit more clearly. Um, so just, it's just about a matter of um, finesse and elevation in these lab reports. Um, because you guys are on the college level, you guys have to remember that. Um, you know, as like cheesy as it is, like you're not in high school anymore, you know, like I'm really, I'm trying to push your writing forward to be acceptable at the um, college level that you guys are at and to really prepare you for what's coming, right? You know, either, either college-wise or career-wise. So writing with a little bit more finesse, act like you're almost like a robot, unless it's some, there's some parts where you can act more like a person, but I'll point those out to you guys. So um, furthermore, in this video, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll go through the rubric again because uh, I want to just point out things that a lot of people just missed, I think, in the lab report and just kind of go over them again. It's been a while since we talked about it and then just keep it in mind for lab report two. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so this is this is um, this was the rubric, right? So first and foremost was the title. Um, majority of you guys did great on this. Um, you'll see in your um, comments that I gave. I went through the rubric and I said, you know, three out of three. So you're rubric grade for the cover page is six out of six. However, I added an extra point in here because I realized when you count all these points up, it doesn't lead to a hundred points. It leads to like 99. So I don't know why, but this rubric's a little off. So I usually put like seven out of seven, right? However, these were super easy points that sometimes every once in a while a student completely missed. And the way you completely miss that is if you wrote uh, your title as lab report one or bacteria lab report. You know, that doesn't, you, you shouldn't write the title as literally lab report. So avoid doing that. Tell me, your title should tell me what your main subject was in the experiment. And then it should also tie into the hypothesis. So if you wrote in bacterial growth, it was like you're like this close to getting the title right. It should be like bacterial growth under two temperature conditions or something like that because temperature was a main point. The temperature was a main um, 
tie into the hypothesis. So you needed to put those together into your, into your title page, which the majority of you guys did. Again, avoid overwording this, you know, bacterial growth into temperature conditions. It's fine. You know, some people had, if you have like two whole lines, it's probably like overwording or or overwording your uh, title. And a lot of times I think maybe students do this to sound like more fancy, you know, the conditions in which bacterial growth in a 37 versus a 30 um, temperature and yada, and incubators and yada, yada, yada. It just, they're trying to sound more, um, you know, they're trying to give it more finesse, but you know, it should just be very exact. You know, finesse comes from using the proper um, vocabulary to describe the methods that you did or describe the main points, but it doesn't necessarily mean adding a whole bunch of words into your titles or to, into your statements. So just try to keep that in mind. So moving on, we'll talk about the abstract. Um, the thing with the abstract that had me a little confused is that uh, some students didn't really use the example that we went over in class, and I, and don't, I don't really understand why. So my main point to this um, rubric is go back to that example, read it thoroughly, because there are key words in there that you need to state in your abstract, you know. The goal of this experiment is blank, you know those statements I was looking for and I couldn't find them. And maybe you were writing like, this experiment looks at, you know, bacterial growth underneath two conditions. And that's really your goal, but you didn't literally state the goal of this experiment. So those are key phrases that a reader looks for in a scientific paper because it tells, um, because if not, you're kind of assuming that that's your goal and you don't want your reader, your reader to assume um, what your goal is or what your background is or your methods or anything like that. You need to be very specific with your with your phrases. So make sure you look back at that example and also don't be scared to write out those headers how I had them. You know, I had background, I had goal, I had methods and results and major conclusion written out in my abstract. So do the same, you know, like uh, a lot of you guys took that out, which I'm not sure why I remember saying in class to leave those little subheaders within your abstract because that helps your reader as well. Um, and then another main thing about this um, abstract is that your major conclusion is not just repeating the results. So you can't just say, you know, my T test, uh, my T value led me to a statistical significance and, you know, there were warmer conditions in the um, there were more growth in the warmer conditions, right? So your major conclusion is how your results and how your findings of this experiment relate back to the real world. So, you know, because I discovered that bacteria really like to grow and the 37 degrees C Celsius um, temperature, I need to tell the world or the scientific community blank. I need to tell them, you know, don't leave food out at this degree because it's a danger zone and, you know, bacteria like to grow at this temperature so you could get sick or bacteria are disease causing, there are a lot of bacteria that are in fact disease causing bacteria. So um, be aware of this danger zone or this dangerous um, temperature because it could cause illness and you don't want to get sick. So relating it back to like illnesses, relating it back to, to diseases, anything like that is how you come up with a major conclusion. And then you would probably state like, you know, and further research is, you know, valuable to this topic just to kind of conclude it. Now in the introduction, um, I want to highlight this issue relates, you know, describing your background information that relates to your hypothesis and experiment. So a lot of times students told me, you know, gave me examples of how, you know, there's bacteria that grow in the very extreme environments, you know, there's bacteria that grow in the very cold or the very, you know, hot. And that doesn't really and like that's true, but that doesn't really relate to my hypothesis or to my experiment. We did not test the extremes. We tested a 30 degrees Celsius and a 37 degrees Celsius. So um, really relating back to our hypothesis is giving us a little bit of background. You know, tell me about 
the characteristics of um, bacteria. You're like a lot of people just started the intro right away with like this study looked at this and these are my variables and blah blah. You didn't even introduce what bacteria are. Um, the way a main advice I would give to writing an introduction is writing it as if you're, um, you know, introducing your topic and your reader is going to be another college student, but maybe they're not biologists, and maybe they're not even in the sciences, maybe they're, um, you know, liberal arts or something like that. They are at a college level, so they know how to read, you know, vocabulary. They understand, like, how your vocabulary words more than likely, but they probably don't know the details of what bacteria are and what their main characteristics are. So, starting off with what bacteria are, what their main characteristics are, where do they live, things like that, um, start to introduce your main topic. And your main topic was bacteria, right? But then you need to start tunneling it in, right? Because you start really general usually in your introduction, you know, bacteria are these kind of organisms, that yada, yada, yada. And then you start kind of getting really, really specific. So um, you need to start tunneling it in to um, relate it to your hypothesis or experiment. You need to state, like, uh, really this is stating your gap in the field is what I like to call it. But, you know, even though all these characteristics are known, you know, even though this is well known about bacteria, they, they like to grow here, yada, 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 even though this is known, you know, the growth in the temperatures 30 degrees uh, Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius has yet to be examined or has not been looked at or anything like that. That relates this background into your hypothesis, right? The, that ties everything together. Without that statement, you have a really like misconnection between the two. You're introducing bacteria, but then you're telling me that what you're um, what your study is about. And there's really a lack of uh, connection between the two. So an all those statement or a yet, ha yet to be examined statement is really crucial. And we've talked about this for your abstract. Um, so if you have it in your abstract, you wanna kind of just even copy and paste it into your intro because it should be relatively the same kind of although or yet to be examined. And then from there, that statement starts to blend in the next part of your intro. So the next part is state your your purpose. So I've given you a little bit of bacterial characteristics and I've said, you know, although these characteristics are well known, um, the growth at um, 30 degrees or, or even just keeping a general and not so specific, the growth at, um, I would even say, although that all these characteristics are well known, the dependence on uh, that growth has on temperature has yet to be examined because there should be a dependence and there should be a relationship between those two. You know, the more warm that I make it for the bacteria, the more growth I got for bacteria. So it was, the growth was dependent on the temperature, right? So that has yet to be examined and stating my purpose, right? So, and therefore, the purpose of this experiment is to evaluate the relationship between bacterial growth and temper conditions or environmental temperature or something like that. You know, it starts to flow a little bit better if you put these kind of um, phrases in, you know, yet to be examined. Therefore, the purpose of this experiment is, and then, um, after that, you would say, to conduct this experiment, I would, um, oh no, a step, a step before that, I'm sorry. You would say, you know, therefore my, my purpose is to look at these conditions. And therefore, you know, I would, there would be a high hypothesis of, uh, or you would say, therefore there would be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a little janked up there. So you would have your, your, your purpose statement, you know, therefore the purpose of this experiment is to examine these conditions. And then you would state your hypothesis. So furthermore, a null hypothesis of this experiment would be that there is no 
dependence on um, temperature with growth. And an alternative hypothesis to this purpose or to this experiment is that there is a dependence of growth and temperature. And there is that relationship. So tying in your background characteristics first, talking about your, your bacterial characteristics first, tying that in as a, although all this is known, you know, this has yet to be examined, you know, my study has yet to be examined, ties in your purpose. Therefore, the purpose of this experiment is to, you know, look at this relationship. And furthermore, the, hy the null hypothesis is no change or no dependence. And therefore, the alternative hypothesis is that there is a dependence. There is this relationship. And lastly, you would say, in order to look at this relationship, I, this experiment or this study is going to do the following methods. You know, we're going to, um, and it should be very brief, almost since it's just in the introduction, um, this little description of methods. It should be very brief. It, it's almost as if um, whatever you wrote up here in the abstract, right? So almost like just a few sentences to introduce your methods. So just a little introduction of methods that follows your, all, your hypothesis, right? Um, you know, the methods that we're going to look to conduct this um, experiment in order to look at this relationship um, is going to be us growing bacteria on um, plates, right? And then putting them in either a 30 or a 37 degree incubator and letting them grow for a week and um, then counting them and, and doing a t-test analysis. So you needed to have introduced your t-test analysis um, because that, that is uh, what you did, right? It's part of your methods in order to look uh, to calculate your data. And then, of course, you want to add in your two citations. To end that introduction, you don't want to end with your methods like, okay, we did a t-test dot. You know, like, it kind of, like, it doesn't have, like, a good conclusion to your introduction. So what I would do, actually, is go up here and look at this. You know, relate this to the experimental world. So, okay, we did these methods, and we did a t-test analysis, and we'll see what happens. Um, lastly, um, this review would like to point out the, the real-world impact that this study has. You know, um, this this study serves as a warning to people um, leaving their uh, a warning to people at that um, may not know that bacteria like to grow at the 37 degrees Celsius. So that's really how your experiment relates to the real world. Is how what do you want your the scientific community to know about your findings, about your results, and it's you know. Bacteria are disease-causing bacteria, so they are likely to cause illness if you keep them at a certain temperature. And my study shows that at 37 degrees Celsius, they like to grow. So you're going to want to avoid keeping your workplaces at this temperature. You're going to want to avoid keeping your food at this temperature, anything like that that can cause illness. So that's where your voice kind of comes in with what example you want to choose in order to show how your your experiment relates to the real world. But that's really the only time that your voice really shows. The rest is just kind of like reporting the facts and the findings, right? So that kind of wraps up your introduction. If you hit all those notes, then you got all the points. But usually I just put in comments like, you need to say this just a little bit more clearly, or you need to elevate it, you need to have more finesse. You needed those key phrases that we're looking for. Those signal phrases come really in handy, you know. Um, therefore, furthermore, in conclusion, all those kind of statements add finesse to your, to your report without sounding too um, wordy, right? It's actually helping your flow.
So the next part was materials and methods. A lot of people weren't literally listing or weren't literally bulleting, but you were listing. So if you, what I mean by that is if you wrote a statement that said the materials used in this lab were plates, um, cotton swabs, yada, 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 yada. You're listing the materials. So you're still, you know, even though you didn't format it as a list, you're still listing it. So it clearly says no lists or bullets or numbers, etc. So you want to avoid doing this. And how you do that is by just looking at the protocol that we went over in class. So, um, Actually, let me go ahead and pull that up because I feel like that will help you guys. Let me see if I have it. All right, and I think I do. All right, and let me share the screen. Okay, so here's the protocol. So you want to not just list the materials. And yes, it's listed in a protocol, not a report, right? So that's perfectly fine here. But in your report, you want to avoid doing these bullets or whatever. And how you do that is you just start by describing your methods. And any time you mention one of the um, Anytime, the very first time you mention one of these materials, like if you said, you know, eight TSA agar plates were used to grow the bacteria, you need to give further details on what that is and why it was important to use that exact material in your study. So, you know, these plates represent a good medium for bacteria to grow in. They have been used for years now. They're well established as um, growth mediums for bacteria, you know, it, give me a little bit of detail on why, you know, cotton swabs were used because, you know, they're uh, non-expensive and they do the job well, you know, everyone knows what a cotton swab is, but you need to use detail on why this experiment used it, you know, and um, you need to really keep in mind your reader in the method. So anytime another researcher looks at um, reports, right? It looks at scientific reports or journals or whatever. They're And they're really paying attention to their methods. It's because they're gonna replicate the study or it's because they're gonna use the study and maybe tweak it a little bit to do their own study, right? Maybe I'm a reader who's interested in your report because I'm now gonna look at 25 degrees Celsius and 47 degrees Celsius. So. I'm gonna use your results and then add to that. Um, but I want to do the exact same methods as you, so that way there's no biasness between our two, exper our two experiments, right? So moving on, what you would really wanna do is start right here. So let's imagine I'm typing out my methods report. I would probably begin with, you know, this, to conduct this study, the, the components of the experiment were first determined. So if you notice inside your rubric, right, inside your rubric, it literally says to identify your controls and your experimental groups and your dependent and your, var and your independent variables, right? So that is part of your methods. You sitting down, if you remember that day, you guys sat down and you guys worked on a handout before I gave you your plates, you had to tell me what your controls were, what your um, hypothesis was gonna be. You know, that was the first step in your method. So that's technically your first step that you should write about. So, you know, to begin this experiment, the components of the study were determined. And, um, you know, so, you know, the controls were going to be um, plates that were swabbed with sterile, sterile water, you know, and then details on why that was important. This is important because this checks aseptic technique. Um, I should have no growth on these plates because if there had been growth, that's, that's showing that 
bacteria can just grow spontaneously or that, that maybe my technique is wrong. Maybe I accidentally hit my glove before swabbing or anything like that. If you don't have any growth, you can say that with certainty that your technique was correct because in your control plates, you didn't have growth. So explain those details into your methods, right? Expl don't just assume that the reader knows what a control is used for. You know, we did two replicates um, for each variable. These were our variables, which are kind of listed right here inside the protocol for you guys. Um, you know, the null hypothesis was going to be this, and the alternative was this. That's not really necessary in the methods. You did state that one inside the intros, but all the other kind of variables, all the other kind of components are really necessarily to describe into the methods. So start there. Then you would state, you know, you know, step number two was to, you know, or, you know, or next we, in the study, we began by practicing, I'm sorry, you let me just clarify, you do not want to say we, you know, next, the experiment began by um, practicing aseptic technique. This included um, scientists using lab coats, tying back their hair if necessary, washing their hands, um, placing on gloves, even that, the there is bothering me. See, even I struggle with this. It takes me a while to write like a robot is like what I like what I usually like to say. So, um, you know, practicing aseptic technique is important because it keeps um, the the study sterile. It keeps um, your technique proper, right? And that, and therefore, this study did the necessary steps, such as um, wearing lab coats tying back hair, washing hands, and using gloves, right? Something like that. Uh, the next step was to plate the controls, you know, yada, yada, yada. We used this, um, a Z pattern was used to swab the um, plates. But more than that, if you introduce that Z pattern, again, you need to give detail on what that Z pattern does you know why was it important it was all here inside the protocol so just really for the next time or anytime you have to read, write a report for the methodology you should go back to your protocol back to your instructions and literally rewrite this into a paragraph and then using signal phrases like firstly or secondly, next, lastly, in conclusion, you know, those help the flow of that, you know, even if you had to do like step one was to do this, but that's borderline listing and borderline bullet points, so you want to kind of avoid that, but just try to get in that practice of taking this exact protocol and then writing a report on it, writing it in paragraph, writing it in full sentences, and including all the details that are necessary. So that would be next step. Something that I want to point out is that, um, let's see here, this protocol, I remember it was for day one, um, tape it together and put it into the incubator and they'll be there for about four days. They were actually in there for a week. Um, but one thing that I want to point out is that this is the protocol for day one. There was a day two, remember? You guys got your plates out, you counted them, and you performed a teeth test, and that is still continuing your methods. So your methods does not stop with we put them into the incubator and we cleaned up our area. No, it should still continue, you know, seven days later, we took the plates out, we did a count, we calculate any kind of calculations that you did, you need to add them into your into your methods and you need to state the formulas you use. So if you said, you know, we took them out, we counted them, and we calculated averages per variable, you need to state what the formula for averages is. You know, this meant that we took the number of bacterial colonies and we divided it, right? For um, we added the two plates together and we divided it by two, right? 
Um, we continued by calculating variance. The formula is this. We calculated variance pooled. The formula is this. Um, all until we calculated a t-test um, value and the formula for a t-test value is that. And that's why in the rubric, in the rubric, right? Let's see where that is. Yes, so that's why in the rubric it says to include your t-test formula and the reason for t-test. So you say, you know, that's still part of your methods. You performing a t-test analysis is a method that you did. And then, you know, you adding in the detail of the formula and the reasons, the details of why you did it, right? So the t-test will tell me how sig uh, statistically significant my findings are. You know, just something short and simple like that because you're gonna go into more detail on that in the results, right? Again, no bulletins, write it in past tense. Um, I can't stress this enough. I had a lot of mixed tenses, which was kind of strange, you know, like um, the next step will be loading the sample. It, no, or, or it was like the next step will be loaded samples. So like the loaded was ED, so that sounded past tense, but you said will be loaded. So the will be is present tense. So um, those mixing of tensing, tenses doesn't work. And I think that happens a lot to um, second, um, English as a second language kind of um, issues, which is totally fine, but I did point them out because um, I'm trying to elevate your writing here, right? And the main people that can help with that is the writing center tutors. I used to be one and I would just sit there and kind of explain why they, you know, the tenses need to all, um, they can't have any inconsistencies and it should be in the past tense when you're talking about methods because you're describing what you did do in the study and not what you will be doing in the study. Where a protocol, a protocol is usually um, in the, in the present tense, you know, pick up your cotton swab and swab it because it is instructions on what you will do. So protocol is in the present tense and a report is in the past tense. And then just a lot of details on why, what materials you used and why they're important, but just integrate them into the steps that you took. So anytime, don't ever kind of separate that. That all should be integrated. That's why it's method slash materials. Another word that I like to use for this is methodology, right? Kind of finesse, finessing this header, right? So me the methodology would include methods and materials. So just integrate it, make a report, make it, um, make that protocol into different paragraphs and you should be fine. So, um, so for ex example, I'm sorry, for the next um, report, you guys are looking at the, at the Manduka report, you're gonna want to include any calculations that you did with your data and any of the formulas and the reasons why here in the methods, right? And I'll go over, over that Manduka project in the, next, the very next video. So the next common mistakes were in the results and this is really where a lot of people got points taken off. Like, you know, I got like four out of 15s and it was really hard to grade. Um, I tried to give you guys points when it's there, but if you guys miss it, then you guys miss it. Like if you didn't, if you just did not put a graph in, then I couldn't give you these two points. And I remember talking about it when we went over this rubric in class and I said, you know, the tables are tables, they are not graphs. So if you copied and pasted the template that we used, um, the one that goes over the t-test analysis and how to do it, the one that I created. So if you use that, those charts, that is, those are tables or charts, they are not graphs. So what you could have done is gathered those averages and made it made a bar graph or a line graph. You could have um, gathered the counts even and done a line graph or a bar graph. You could have, um, you know, there's a there's a range of things. Like I think that was probably the easiest was in just grabbing the average growth at 30 and the average growth at 37, two little columns and showing that the 37 is higher, right? 
that probably would have been your best bet. Um, but majority of the students didn't do that. I'll say like the people that did definitely got an A. A majority of the students did not put in the, um, any kind of graph. They just you usually put in the table. So maybe there was a little miscommunication with that. I'm, I'm positive I was really clear with that when I went over the rubrics. If anything, I did count your like bell graph as your one graph, you know, because that was used to interpret the the t test, right? It was setting your critical values at a certain area. But if you didn't refer to this graph or you didn't add a description um, caption into this graph, you kind of just copied and pasted and threw it in there. Then you know, there's not much I can do because you didn't explain what that represented. So I'm going to open up that template next, actually. I can never find it. Oh, here it is. So here was your t-test example, right? You guys usually plugged in whatever count you got for water, um, your cell phones, and um, or whatever whatever um, surface that you use, and then the two variables of 30 and 37, right? And then, oh, sorry. Me. Marty. Sorry about that. All right, so a lot of you guys just copied and pasted these um, little charts or this little little example that I had, which isn't really proper, right? Like maybe this one could be copied and pasted, but you even left like all these different colors, right? Um, and if you're gonna leave these different kind of colors, you need a, a description caption that says, you know, blue represents water, red represents cell phone at 30. You know, every little detail that needs to be explained needs to be inside a description, a descriptive caption, because if not, you're just assuming that the reader will understand what you meant by color coding. Um, so maybe this one could be used, maybe this one could be copied and pasted, but you have these over here that a lot of people copied and pasted, which aren't really necessary. Um, this is a lot of wording, right? Um, it's not necessary, it's just a text box with words, right? You guys can see how this is different than a table or a graph, right? So you needed to use this information and come up with your own table or your own um, chart with your own titles and your own, um, you know, these, this needs to have a title up here, you know, whether it's, you know, calculations done or whatever, uh, describing these steps, right? And then the results, you need to refer to these to this table. So this should have, you know, figure one, you know, data collected from bacterial under each variable, you know, a little description. This table looks at yada, yada, yada. And then in the paragraph where you're literally writing out your results, you say, you know, for a general description of um, data collected, please, you know, look at, or figure one could be examined, you know, figure one looks over these issues, something along those lines. So you, in the paragraph where you're writing out your results, you wouldn't necessarily want to um, write out every single detail, like, sorry, write out every single detail, like, um, you know, pl plate one looked like this and had three colonies and plate two looked like this and had four colonies and plate four looked like this. That's almost like listing, right? Put all that information in the table and then refer to it inside your results. Now that makes your results paragraph pretty short, right? Like, 
refer to table <coughs> one for refer to table one for general calculations or refer to table two for the graph or whatever, right? But you need to actually write about your main findings. So the main findings are um, the main findings. Oops. Or in this paragraph. So the main findings were that 37, you know, it's clearly shown in the graph one or in figure two in this chart and this table that 37 degrees Celsius led to a higher growth. You know, that's referring to the table, but still writing about your main findings. Um, furthermore, uh, the chart shows that Marty, sweetie. Sorry, you guys. Furthermore, the chart shows that, you know, plate seven, which was, you know, 37 degrees Celsius, had the highest growth. You know, again, this kind of result is evident between the two graphs and the two charts. You know, this is really important in referring to your tables and figures. Now, when it go, when you go, you know, when you move on from just like the counts and the averages and you move on to start describing the t-test results, you know, you really do need to add in um, what that second, that second page was about. So you need to say, you know, t-test was calculated, see um, chart number two, for uh, you know how this was done uh, this includes the formulas that were done this includes you know each step that was taken you need to literally show your math for your reader because if you just claimed you know a t-test was done and i got the value of 29 then that doesn't really tell me anything as a reader why not 28 why not 27 why not 32 what is what about 29 is important what what you know why is why how do i interpret this value this t-test value right and this was described here in this next step so more than that how did you get to 29 you need to show your math how you got to 29 in your results, probably by a chart or a table, something similar to this, I would think. Um, just adding more details because you don't want to lose out on these steps, right? So trying to combine these kind of charts together. Referring to, like, this is how my math was done into the results paragraph. And then claiming your results, right? Claiming that I got a t-test value of 29. You know, and then furthermore, what this t-test value represents is this, yada, 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 and putting this into the paragraph, describing this inside your paragraph that you're writing. But you might want to relate to something like this, right? Because you do have to claim what a critical value is, what you set your degrees of freedom at, um, you know, what chart you looked at. It was a page on page 26, right? What you filled out. And um, really putting this into your own words into that paragraph and then maybe representing it inside this little pair bell chart that was on pa page 26 creating your own plugging in those values and then having a little descriptive cap descriptive caption underneath that to um really go over what those meant right uh, what this represents so uh, if you didn't include how you got your math done and what this t-test value means so you didn't tell me what your critical values were what you set your p-value to be or your alpha value or anything like that then you kind of skipped out a lot on the description of your results so you really got some points taken out right here and more than just listing what your p-value was what your critical value was you always need to give details on what that represents, you know, what the p-value of 0.5 represents a probability value of 0.5, meaning that you're 99.5% sure in the results that you found, right? Um, the t-value tells you if you can reject or accept your null hypothesis. That was talked about here in the in the example, I already clicked out of it. 
you know, that was talked about here. You know, we can conclude that the population means were significantly different at the 0 0.05 level of significance. That is the difference of the product surfaces resulting in significantly different amounts of bacteria. So this was critically, um, your, t, your t value really just determined that you had statistical significance. So you needed to say something along those lines. You just claimed what your t value was without really giving any detail on, um, on what it represented, then I definitely took out points because that was kind of one of the main points behind your methodology, right? And let's see here. One. Okay, and again, you could have created a better graph, an actual graph, you know, a bar chart or a line graph, something like that. Those that those that I just showed were charts, right? They were tables. They were not graphs. If you only copied and pasted from that template that we use, then you didn't put a graph in, especially if you didn't even include that little bar chart that goes over critical values. Then I have like no way to give you any points there. Um, now this was worth four points, so it really shouldn't have been looked over, and that is to include descriptive captions, in, you know, appropriately placed. So maybe a lot of times you guys put a little title up there, or you guys put like table one, you know, average growth or something like that. So you labeled it and you titled it. So whenever you put table one, that's a label or figure one, chart one, that's something that that's a label, and then putting it, you know column average growth you know that was a title for your for your figure right but you didn't add a description caption and that is why i added that into your um into blackboard right i think that i have it here Okay, so I have it here. Let me see here. Let me just share my screen. It's not letting me. All right, so I have put this into um, your Blackboard. It should say like lab report feedback or something like that. And this really goes over a main, you know, again, a lot of people lost a lot of points on this results paragraph and results section. So I went ahead and started an, an example already. All right, here it is. Here is the example that I posted on Blackboard already. So you can see that I would label the figure, you know, figure one. I always like to use figures. A lot of people use like table one, and then this would be like graph one. And, you know, if they had photos of the, of the plates of what, you know, to show what you guys see in the plates, then you would put like photograph one. And it's all just the same. If I just put figure one, figure two, figure three, then when I'm writing about it inside the results paragraph, then I could easily just state, um, you know, figure, as seen in figure one, as seen in figure two, and as seen in figure three, and every, the flow is just a little bit better. So I like to use figure one. Um, whatever you guys like to use, it's on, it's on you, but um, this, that's just kind of my advice. I like to bold my label and my um, title, right? So this is my label and title here, calculated figure one, calculated averages per color, right? And this has nothing to do with the bacterial experiment. I just kind of created this little, um, this little table and this little graph to represent, um, you know, what, what can be done for results. And then this would be the descriptive caption I'm talking about. You know, this table represents each count per variable, you know, variables being green and red. 
The average was then calculated as a result of these counts. You know, even I'm kind of nitpicking in my own um, results here, but you could have put the average was then calculated, you know, via this formula, maybe in parentheses, put the formula that for average, right? Uh, you know, as a result of these counts, the green had an average of 55. This was a main result. Green had an average of 55, whereas red had an average of 44. Those are the main results, right? And then the major conclusion is that green has a larger average than in red, right? So this is kind of the description caption. You need to explain what all your variables were, what is being represented, how everything was calculated, and um, so I would even put the average was then calculated mean equals um, counts counts divided by three, right? So adding in the formulas, um, describing how everything was calculated, and then, you know, the little results that happen uh, that the table describes, right? And then the major result that the table describes. And in your paragraph where you talk about it, you know, as seen in figure one, you would refer to this major result, res, result, this major finding, right? So as seen in figure one, green has the larger average com as compared to red. So that's what you talk about in the paragraph, but you give more detail in, in your charts and in your description, um, descriptive caption. Instead of just listing everything that happened, you know, green had 54 and 32 and 78 and an average of 55 and red had a count of 68 and 22. If you're talking about all those details inside your results paragraph, the things get lost. So always wrap all those data into a table put the details in the descriptive caption, and then tell me what the main findings are in the results paragraph. And then the same thing for, this is what I've been talking about, you know, tables and charts versus an actual graph. Here's a, an example of an actual graph. So this is what you should have added into your um, report and, you know, moving forward, make sure you add an actual graph into your reports. But you'll notice that Yes, it has a label and a title down here, but it also has the title in the graph, right? It has its axes labeled. So that was something that I, I saw a lot of students miss. You gotta wanna be sure that these details have um, been clarified. And if these have units, make sure you put the units into the axes. And then again, describe what's happening inside this, inside this whole figure, right? You know, this graph represents each average per variable, you know, green versus red. There's a clear visual representation of green having a larger average, 55, than red having 44. This is evident by the larger bra column that's represented in green over the smaller bar column that represents in red, you know. And then talking about that inside your results paragraph, your actual writing, you would say, you know, as seen in figure two, green has the larger average count than, you know, red. You know, again, this is evident in a bar chart and therefore a, a better visual representation of the data. You know, the purpose of these graphs is to help your reader, like, literally visually see what your result was. So seeing it up here in this table, 55 versus 44, yeah, you know that 55 is larger than 44. But if I had a whole table of a whole lot of data, like you do in the bacteria, right, you have eight different plates, so it's a bunch of numbers, and it's not as easy to see visually as a graph, right? If you labeled all your seven, I mean your eight um, plates, or even just the averages, so the four um, different um, variables, then you would assume that water was very low because that was your control. And then you would explain that into here, you know, water was a little to no column because it is a control column and there shouldn't be growth. You would have seen that 30 maybe was like middle, right? 
and then 37 was like a large bar graph so that visually it would have been represented. So this is really important to your reader. And if you have any other questions about results, don't be afraid to um, email me because that is the right main part that a lot of people um, really struggled with. So let's go back to the rubric. All right, so again, in the rubric, um, after, after kind of describing all that, so a lot of people put in their tables and figures uh, neatly and your axes is labeled and things like that. But again, um, if you looked at the, the example I just talked about, I put everything in its own little text box. So putting those little borders helps you kind of align where you need those results to be and keeps things very, very neat. So that was just a little advice that we didn't talk about in class or anything, and yet you wouldn't really know about until someone tells you, you know, oh, you should add it in a little text box and, you know, make sure you bold this and put it all together like this because it, that's kind of the appropriate way that it's done. So don't be afraid to follow that. Don't be afraid to put your graphs and your, tar and your charts and everything into text box. That way that your graph or table isn't like, there's no misconnect between that and your descriptive caption or your uh, title or your labels. Like everything's wrapped together inside that border. So that keeps everything neat and labeled, right? And then moving on, you need to have a, dis your, the last part was a discussion, right? So previously stated what your results were and how you calculated them and, you know, any graphs to visually represent this data and, you know, some main major results, you know, 37 having the greater growth. That was the result that everyone got, right? But you haven't discussed why this result is important or what about this finding? You know, you discovered this relationship between 37 degrees Celsius and bacteria, like loving it and growing in it, right? So tell me what you want to tell the scientific world. That's how you end your paper. That's how you have your conclusion or discussion. So first you need to say, you know, whether your alternative um, was supported or rejected. And this is shown inside the t-test. That was the whole point behind the t-test, right? So you would have reiterated that. You would have said, you know, my t-test value set at a 0 0.05 p-value showed that I could reject the null hypothesis, right? And therefore, I can accept my alternative hypothesis of bacterial change and um, 37 degree uh, a bacterial growth in that temperature, right? And, you know, to support this, you can see my results, right? Just, you know, this hypothesis is supported by my results in figures one, two, and three. And more importantly, it's supported by the t-test, right? So reiterating those reasons for your decision is important in your conclusion. But then the next step is what this means. So this means that, you know, and how this fits in the real world, and is there any comparison with other research, and yada, yada, yada. So this means that my results I, I want to warn, you know, the scientific community, I want to warn the world that, you know, bacteria like 37 degrees, you know, maybe workplaces or restaurants should be really wary of this, hospitals or whatever should be really wary of this because um, bacteria are disease causing, um, we shouldn't keep any food out at 37 degrees, maybe we should keep surfaces um, colder than 37 degrees, um, hard surfaces or whatever. Um, when we wash our hands, we want to make sure that it is, you know, hotter than 37 degrees, maybe to kill the moths, anything like that. Anything that relates your findings specifically about the 37 degrees Celsius having more growth and how those fi that finding will relate to the real world. Well, how, what do you want to tell the world about that finding? And then you want to compare it to other research. So other research could be, um, you know, 
Stanford did this study that looked at 25 degrees or looked at 45 degrees, and you know they relatively had the same results. This compared to your results to other findings should not be, um, you know, in Spain they did a and they did a um, and you know in Spain they did a, an experiment on viruses and I don't know why but I got a lot of people talking about coronavirus in this back in this report and it doesn't relate to your to your research because that is a virus right so you want to have something that relatable and so maybe that this other research looked specifically at E. coli at 37 degrees so that would really relate to your to your research because you looked at 37 degrees but you didn't look at specific um, bacteria types right you did a general swap so you generally looked at general growth you didn't look at a specific type so you know you can mention that research being done because it further supports your decision of um, accepting your alternative hypothesis. You know, not only is it shown in my study, but it's shown in other studies out there. Um, mentioning weaknesses and biasness, I want to point out that when you mention these weaknesses or like any biasness, you don't want to undermine your methods or the main points. So if you said, you know, maybe I should have looked at um, a temperature of 25 instead, then you're, you're complete, or actually that's a good example of a, of a weakness, you know, like, let me just backtrack instead i'm sorry so when you're mentioning you don't want to undermine your main point or your methods so when you say you know maybe i should have used a different plate or maybe i should have used a different um agar or maybe we shouldn't use cotton swabs or you know we use parafilm to seal them but maybe bacteria got in there you know our technique wasn't really that great the agar rips a lot you know you're undermining your methods so as a reader if i'm reading this i'm like well if you're you know, if you were weak in your methods, then how do I know your results were actually true? Like, yeah, your t-test shows me that you have statistical significance, but, you know, maybe that was just an accident and you guys didn't actually perform a well um, techniqued experiment or study, right? So you don't want to undermine your me your methods. Your methods are spot on, right? And you don't want to have any undermine to your main purpose. And what this was, was to look at different temperatures. So you, if you stated as a weakness or a biasness, like maybe I should have looked at um, different surfaces or different, um, ooh, let me see here. Maybe I should have looked at one specific bacteria or maybe I should have done it. That. That's, that's a whole nother study, right? That's undermining your main purpose. Your main purpose was to look at bacterial growth under those two temperature conditions, right? It was the first one being 30 degree and the other one being 37. So if you're like, well, maybe I should have looked at E. coli only or something like that, then that diff that's a whole different study and you're undermining your main purpose. You wanna stick to your purpose. When you're mentioning weaknesses and biases, you wanna kind of say, you know, we only looked at two temperatures. It would be interesting, you know, to look at um, a more range of temperatures. So if 30, and you want to relate it really into your findings. So if 37 has more bacterial growth, what about 36? What about 35? What about the other side, 38, 39? You know, that shortening that range could help me get more specific into um, bacterial growth and their relationship with temperature, right? And that kind of ties into suggestions of future research. Um, this is where you would state, um, you know, future re see a lot of people wrote that as their future research and that's okay, but moreover, what about your findings could, um, could make you go in a new direction? So if I found out that 37 degrees Celsius um, is a good temperature for bacterial growth, maybe my next question is why you know like maybe i need to look at that those plates open them up scrape the bacteria in there 
and break them down to look at their proteins and look at their enzymatic uh, activity and look at their overall metabolic rates, anything like that, you had took your findings and now you're asking, wait, why? I'm going to start a new research. My future research will look into why I'm seeing this because this study is really based on will you get growth and not really why you got growth. So that's really a good direction on future research. Whereas like, oh, well, maybe I should have looked at, you know, 36 degrees and 25 degrees. That's more about like mentioning your weaknesses. So there is a little bit of difference where the future research really looks at your main result and then says, okay, now that I have this result, what direction can I go in? And then from that, you could add a citation in there, you know. I know that bacteria have this certain enzymatic activities, they do this, do they that to break, have metabolic, uh, certain metabolic rates, and this is evident in the, this citation that I'm going to use, you know, this reference that I found, this article that I've already read, right? So that's how you add in that last citation. Even though I had capitalize this. I did get some students that wrote about it where they said they proved their hypothesis, so I did call that out. Um, lastly was your references page. A lot of people are not in the correct format. Let me see if I can pull up a new um, Word document. Just give me a second. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so let's say that this is my first reference. I know I just typed a bunch of hoopla here, but let's just act as if it's my first reference. Um, if you guys gave me this kind of formula where everything's aligned to the left, I can already tell that that's not AP format. A little uh, little advice that what you can do to get it in that hanging format, right, that APA is supposed to be in, is that you highlight all your, and hopefully I can do this, you highlight the material and you go to paragraph settings, which should be somewhere here. Maybe here. Oh, maybe the line space options. Yes. Yes, so here's your paragraph set settings, right? And in the special, you would change it to hanging. And you would hit OK. And so that'll push the next ones out. You know, this next one should be there. So this becomes your reference one, where you have the first line aligned to the left and the next following lines indented in. So that's the way you get that kind of format in. I'm not sure if a lot of people know that little trick of going here, line spacing options, hitting, changing this heading, hanging and hitting okay. Um, other than that, you should have reference, you know, here in the middle. Just like that, and then ABC order, and then the format that it's supposed to go in, right? And that you can just use like an APA little cheat sheet. You can use a citation maker or whatever to make your citation. But if I didn't see this kind of format, then I took out points because um, I could already tell. Or sometimes students even left them in the like yellow shade, and that comes from just copying and pasting from the um, citation makers. So make sure. If you have everything highlighted yellow, you know, you want to, un, you know, you want to highlight, you want to make sure that you get rid of that highlighting, right? Ooh. Right, and that everything should be black and white, everything should be spaced properly and indented properly. And um, let's see here.
Okay, so that was the reference page there. So those are easy points, but you know, if you really struggled with it, again, the writing center would have helped you with that, or just really taking five minutes to looking looking up what APA format was and you know how it's supposed to look like and or using a citation maker. All those could have helped with those points. So those are easy points that some students got taken away from, but oh, sorry, sorry. Morty. Anyways, so um yeah, just be aware of that if you really have struggled with it, I believe the writing center is still open virtually, so you have a second chance with your um, lab report too. And if you really struggle with it, just um, check out the little hint I gave you where you go to paragraph settings, uh, paragraph settings. And if not, you can just go ahead and email me as your kind of last resort for that. And then overall, minimal to no spelling grammars. This was a huge issue. I had a lot of grammatical issues um, in these papers, a lot of fragments, a lot of run-ons. So always try to be very specific. You know, my main, main advice I can give you guys is to read your paper out loud. After you have written it thoroughly, maybe you've read it a few times and you're still not really seeing any grammar issues, read it out loud. Because if you read out these sentences out loud, you'll say, oh, that was kind of funky and that was kind of like not what I was trying to say. You know, maybe that was a run-on sentence. Maybe that was an incomplete sentence. So if you read it out loud, then you even notice, or even more advice I can give you, like it's way more effective, is have someone else read your paper out loud. So if they read the paper out loud and they struggle with the sentence structure and they kind of like skip over and like have to reread that sentence that you put, then kind of make a little star on it because you know that you're gonna have to reread it out loud. I mean, and then you're gonna have to rewrite it, right? Because then I'm, you know, reading your guys' papers and I tend to read it out loud and I'm like, oh, wait, what? And then I kind of stumble upon and I kind of click it out. Um, and I kind of just, I sometimes point it out, but sometimes I don't. I'm like, okay, that's the same issue. I've already pointed it out a couple times, but I'm not going to point it out a fifth or and a sixth time. So after, after you've made so many of these mistakes, like grammatically, then I just took points off right here. So if you got points taken off right here, you have a lot of grammar issue. So, or if I left the points, but I put a lot of comments on there, then make sure to point this out. The number two issue is the proper tense and words used. So there shouldn't be any I, us, we, and that takes practice because a lot of times you want to say like my group did this or I then scraped the plates or anything like that. So anytime you have struggle with that, you want to kind of change out those words with this study or this experiment or this um, research was done, you know, like you know, the study began by scraping of the plates or whatever you want to say. And that takes practice, but you want to really push yourself to go that way. Even if you used the group or the lab group or something like that, that's not the proper tense. You don't want to say, you know, maybe it's not first or second person, but Marty. <laughs> Marty. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Um, let me go back to that. All right, so again, if you had a lot of issues, I took out points or just read through those comments because I um, try to point it out and try to use the proper tense. No. I, us, you, we, our group, my group, or even the laboratory group, that's still not the proper tense. You know, the study, I don't want to give claim to any of these steps, right? All right, sorry about that. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so using the proper tense, no, I, us, we, our, our, and then more than that, it should be in past tense. Again, we talked about this. Your report is reporting what you did do uh, in the past, right? So 
your methods should stay in the past tense and just be aware of that and all that I know I understand that all this stuff takes practice so it should get better between this lab report one and the next lab report two majority of the people kept their paper nice and neat and organized and you do this by double spacing and putting the appropriate headers however I will say like headers should be on the um, left side so you know, if you had introduction. It should be aligned on the left side here. Aligned right here on the left side, right? And then here's your introduction. Right? But you would indent this first state statement and everything would be double spaced. The only header that's not to the side is your things that go on their own page. So your references, that, that is centered on its own, that's APA style. And then your abstract is centered on its own page. Everything else are little subheaders and they go aligned to the left side. And that's just format issues that maybe you didn't know about. Um, and you could it, you know, have it bolded here you would on you would want to bold those headers you know introduction abstract whatever it is you want to bold that and that just helps with organization um and then you got extra credit if you went to the writing center again i want to say that they're open for virtual um assistance if not please let me know and i'll do something instead for that writing center but i'm pretty sure they're open and if not i think the epcc writing center is open so i might just guide you guys that way um, and then extra credit for turning it in early. So you get that same kind of, um, five points. I'm, I'm, I'm majority of you guys got this one because at the end I was like, just turning it in, you know, like even five minutes before class and I'll give you guys like that turning it in early because we did it online this time around, not in person handouts. Um, so again, just turn it in early and you get these extra five points. So maybe I took points off here and there, but these five points really helped you. But I was surprised at the uh, amount of students that didn't do this writing center um, extra five points, because together that's 10 extra points. So you could have gone from 78 to an 88. Like that's a big difference. Um, more than that, you wouldn't have a 78 in the first place because the writing center would have pointed out those grammatic issues or the tense issues. And so you would have probably got these points, um, these four extra points here, you know, maybe a little bit of neatness and all that. And those points would have bumped you up. So it's like 10 plus four, you know, 14 points because they added extra advice, you know. So there's a lot of extra credit. So, um, your grade is what it is. There's no curving after this. And before I end this video, I know it's a lot longer than I usually do, but I want to give an overall conclusion on any other things I saw. So I know I wrote out, you know, things along the way of when I was grading these um, papers. So, you know, any other common mistakes that I haven't mentioned, I want to mention really fast. Um, okay, so another thing that I saw um, in papers is that you're, you make a lot of assumptions and, um, this kind of correlates to like Western views. So if you say something along the lines of, you know, all humans know about bacteria or all humans have, uh, cell phones, you know, or computers or something like that, like, this is dangerous because all humans have cell phones. You know, that's a very Western view. There's a lot of countries out there where all humans would not have cell phones or anything like that, or all humans do not know about bacteria. So you don't want to make these kind of broad assumptions. You know, they sound very, um, they're not very professional. So you can just omit them. There's no need to state, you know, all humans know. I know that you're trying to put that in there because of the, you know, this has yet to be examined statement. You want to say like all humans know about bacteria, but their growth of the temperature environment has yet to be examined. You, you're tempted to do that, but that's not necessarily true, right? All humans do not know about, about bacteria. There's probably some people out there that don't know about the details that you do.
So you just wanna give bacterial characteristics and say that it's well known. You know, it's well known in the scientific community if you wanna be specific. Um, another issue I have is that some of the sentences don't connect. So you need to use those signaling phrases. So if you were giving those background on the bacterial um, characteristics like, oh, bacteria do this and bacteria do that. And then we look at uh, testing this in the uh, incubators. I'm like, wait, what? All of a sudden there's incubators, right? You need to use those signaling phrases, you know, and therefore to conduct this study, incubators were used or therefore, you know, um, you can just do a Google search of transitional phrases or signal phrases and that should help your flow and your structure of your writing. Um, so avoid fragments, avoid run-ons. And um, sometimes I specifically went like and targeted the actual grammatical issue and that's comma splicing. So comma splicing is when you put two sentences together and just put it a com put a comma on there and it creates this long run on sentence. So usually if your sentence is like three or four lines long, it's probably a, a run on that you put together with comma slices. So um, just be aware of that you if you don't know what I'm talking about, just do a five minute little Google search on what is a fragment, what is a run on, you know, what are comma slices and then be aware of that the next time you write. Um, your lab report. Um, let's see here. A lot of people didn't put detail on what the control plates are for. So um, if they, if you just mentioned, you know, we did water with sterile plates and we put them in the 30 and we did water, uh, we plated water on sterile plates and we put it on the 37, but you didn't tell me what that control represents. Um, then you didn't add enough detail. You know, what is a control variable for? And we talked about this a lot in class and stuff, so make sure you know. Um, another little issue is that you have these long, long paragraphs. So you need to see in your paragraph where you can break it up. So an introduction is not just one long paragraph. You know, maybe you get the background information, you know, bacteria do this, you know, blah, blah, although this is well known, you know temperature dependence on growth has yet to be examined, period. And then you would probably start the next paragraph, you know, indent it and say, you know, the goal of the study is to examine this stuff and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, an intro is not just one large paragraph. It has, you're allowed to put indentions and that you're allowed to break it up into several different paragraphs. So don't be scared of that. Along with all the other ones, you know, results, discussion, if they should be like multiple paragraphs in the in the part of a intro, right? Um, let's see here. You know, there were words that weren't exactly correct. So this is something that you guys got to be, that was really evident. If you didn't know what the study was or the experiment that you guys did and you were kind of lost, then it was really evident inside your papers. So if you said that we were looking for the optimal temperature, that's not necessarily true. Um, we weren't looking for the optimal temperature at growth because that would mean that we would need to look at a huge range of temperatures, right? We um, only looked at growth at 30 and 37, and we only looked to see if there would be growth, right? Yes or no. Was there growth at 37 or not? Was there growth at 30 or not? Was there growth in the water or not? And then we compared the two. Um, we didn't look at what was optimal. So just be wary of that word. Um, um, you, want to, you want to describe your plates that had the bacteria on them as your treated plates. They are not your test subjects or your, you can say experimental groups if that's okay, but in reality, they're all experimental groups. Your, your you know, control groups are part of the experiment. So you want to just refer them to um, the treated plates and the control plates because and that's how we talked about them in class so I'm not sure why you guys started using different vocabulary because we had talked about what treated meant in that handout that we did on day one um, let's see here uh, the fact that you guys used uh, tables and graphs and not really uh, tables as graphs and not really graphs 
you know, um, and the results. Let's see here. Um, okay, another large issue is that I saw when you guys were describing the variables, which was the temperatures, right? You would say two different environments. And that's not necessarily true either, right? We didn't look at two different environments. They all plates were put into an incubator. Different environments would be if I put some plates in an incubator and if I put some plates on the shelf at room temperature in the classroom and if I put some plates out in the garden, right? Those are different environments. They were all put in the same environment, which were the incubators, right? But they were put at different environmental temperatures. So if you wanted to use the word environment, I would have phrased it as environmental temperatures. So there's a big difference between environmental temperatures, you know, 30 versus 37, and actual environments, right? So, or you can just simplify it and say, you know, different temperatures. You don't have to necessarily say environmental temperatures. Um, oh, I saw a lot of students saying that we tested two surfaces and that's not true. I'm not sure where you guys got that from other than the lab manual. And I told you guys we weren't going to be doing that experiment. We were going to focus on the two different temperatures, 30 versus 37. We were not going to swab a cell phone and a table or something like that. We would only picked up bacteria from the cell phone. And more to that, I don't think you guys understood what the cell phone or the keyboard or whatever you swab represented. It was the model of which you chose to pick up bacteria. So it could have been anything. The only reason that we stuck to whatever you picked is to standardize that. So if I swabbed one cell phone and plated it, and then I swabbed a table and plated that, and I just called it, you know, hard surfaces were swabbed, that's too general. That's too much biasness. That's saying, you know, maybe the table had more bacteria because it's um, touched more or something like along those lines. So we standardized it by picking one um, hard surface, a cell phone, and we swabbed that. So a lot of people said, you know, we, we swabbed two surfaces because we swabbed the front of the cell phone and the back of the cell phone. And that's, that's not necessarily true or that's not necessarily the point of the experiment. This or I even got that in the conclusion a lot, you know, in conclusion, um, bacteria likes to grow on cell phones. We didn't, we didn't test this. Um, the cell phone was just a mode. It was just the decision of choosing that cell phone to gather that bacteria up in order to treat our plates with some bacteria. So if you're doing this experiment all over again, you have to understand that, okay, I'm going to spray some with water and there should be no, no bacterial growth. The second one, where am I going to get my bacteria from? I could either swab something that I use that bacteria is probably living on, or I can order some bacteria. So we chose to swab something that we use that probably has bacteria on, right? We swab the cell phone. So uh, if you made some kind of results or something like that based on, you know, cell phones and blah, 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 then you lost the main point of your experiment. The main point of your experiment was the two different temperatures, not the surface that you swapped. And um, let's see here. So a lot of times I was just pointing out things that were not necessarily true. So you never want to put stuff in your report that were not necessarily true. So if you added something like that, it's not, it's just not true. So I had to point it out, right? Um, and a lot of that was inside your methods. You know, it was like I used two plates as a control and the rest of the six were um, treated plates. That's not true. Four plates were the control and four plates were the treated plates. So, you know, just writing those statements that are not necessarily true, I couldn't really give you any credit for it, right? Um, let me see what else. Yeah, just this mix of tenses. So I saw a lot of like, the plates will be swabbed. The will be is present tense and the swabbed is past tense. So that's not grammatically correct, right? 
it, you should just say the plates were swabbed, right? right? Just keeping that inside the past tense is really crucial for your, for your, um, for your paper. And I'm just looking over anything else. A lot of people miss the major conclusion, you know, tell me how your findings better the world, better the scientific community. On a, on a large, big picture scale, tell me why your results are important. Um, and instead, you would just repeat your results. Like, my major conclusion is that 37 degrees gave more growth. Like, that's just repeating your results. That's not your major conclusion. So just be aware of that. Yeah, a lot of times you guys did not mention why the Z pattern was correct. So all these little details inside your method, anytime you introduce a new concept, you need to add details. You need to define what that was and describe what that was. And um, going back to this major conclusion, if you guys referred um, your future research to look at enzymatic activities and stuff like that, you don't, maybe you quoted like another report that looked at this, but you didn't really go further and tell me, you know, how you would look on that. And I understand that's maybe above your pay grade or something like um, you don't really know how to design an experiment, but just something. Um, you know, you could have seen this really quick in the in the search. Really, like, how do I look at enzymatic activity in bacteria? And look up any design, experimental designs, to kind of suggest your uh, your direction of future re uh, research. So, if you did mention it, I give you major kudos because a lot of people didn't. But if you, um, but no one really mentioned it and then went into detail, and that's really how a scientific report should be done. And um, it looks like that is all my all my comments, all my commentary on your guys's lab report one. I know it's a lot. Um, view this. I hope you guys viewed this um, video at your leisure because it is a lot. Um, but I really the main point why I had to get this off my chest is to help you guys further your writing, right? So again, the link gets harder from here. And I hope that this advice helps you. It's advice that I've gotten when I was a student or advice that I've gotten through, um, you know, trainings and things like that as a writing center tutor. Um, if you, you know, my comments, I write a lot better than I speak. Uh, it takes me practice sometimes and it, it's it's we are in the very beginning of our writing careers as scientists we become professional writers so I'm not sure if anyone's explained that to you when you have written a report in under in your career you want to get it published into a journal and you become you become a professional writer at that point once you're published in a journal just as much as you know jk rowling is for harry potter you are a published writer you are a professional writer in your field so it's really exciting i don't know if you guys ever thought like oh i'm going to be a writer one day but that is true if you're going into the field of biology um more than likely it's true so learning these steps um, and really getting the finesse and the details. It's a very detailed oriented where JK Rowling writes beautiful stories and beautiful imageries. We are just spitting out the details and the facts and the findings of our, of our experiment. So it's very different than free writing. And again, I hope that I helped you kind of pushed you in uh, in your writing because I think it's really important. And I mean it by no harm. My comments are not personal. They are just really to help you guys and help my students. So thanks for listening. And um, I hope this helps with the lab report too. Bye.